All right, welcome back everyone. We're gonna continue our discussion on masonry. This is gonna be part two in our three-part series of masonry. Uh, in this lecture, what we're gonna talk about is the manufacturing process and some properties of our clay masonry units and our concrete masonry units. Um, if you follow along with the textbook, this corresponds to 4.4 .4 to 4.6. So let's jump on into it. When we talk about the manufacturing of these clay masonry units, there is a process. Uh, it starts with mining our raw materials and then crushing those materials, uh, storing them at some place before pulverizing them, uh, screening them out for screening out the larger particulates that we don't want. Uh, then we're going to form them and cut them, uh, coat them and glaze them with like a protecting coating or a something that will change the characteristics that we're looking for. Then we have the, the drying of our uh, clay and then the firing of our clay and finally storage and shipping. So this is a flow chart of everything that's going on. Winning is just another word for mining. After we mine our materials, then we're crushing it and then storing it at some place for a while, right? Before we continue this, this refining by pulverizing our material and then screening out uh, to get just the fine particulates, right? Then we're forming it into, you can see that this is like an extrusion type thing where we're forming our bricks and we're cutting it into these individual bricks here. After we're cut into these individual bricks, that's when we look at this coating that we're spraying on there. Uh, and once we spray all our coating on there, we're letting them dry and firing, baking it all in, right? And once it's all baked in, we have our final brick that we can ship it off to whoever it needs and store it for when we're going to install it. So. Here's a YouTube video. Uh, if you feel like it, uh, I recommend watching that video. It kind of goes through this whole process and gets you, lets you see what the, the process looks like in, in the real world. So let's take a look at this section right here where it says forming our bricks. So when we talk about forming our clay masonry units, there are really a couple different processes we can use. One is this stiff mud process. And basically that's what this looks like where we're extruding it through, right? We're pushing it through some mold. And uh, after we do that, um, then we can go ahead and cut it into the individual shapes or individual blocks. This is producing uh, uh, bricks with the lowest absorption. And this is actually our, our most common method, right? Now the next two involve using a mold and we're pushing it into the mold. Uh, and we're using this with, with our clays that are less plastic, meaning if we were to push it through and extrude it, what would happen is it start to fall apart, right? So instead of that, we put it into these molds and then it's just a matter of if, if it's a uh, soft mud uh, or if we're using a dry press process, right? With these steel molds. But both of them work on the same principle that we're using this mold. Uh, dry press, we have this uh, steel mold and we're using extra pressure, right? Versus the soft mud, we don't need as much pressure because the, the it's softer, so it'll push out into the mold. Now we talk about these clay masonry units. There are really three different types we can look at. One is a solid brick where uh, the only thing we're relying on for our bond strength, remember the bond strength was when the mortar is going up into our voids. Uh, where our bond strength is really just a function of the porosity of the solid, right? Uh, the little voids in there. Versus if I have a cord or a cell, I can see there's these, these large voids, these actual holes or cores taken out of the brick, where when we, are, uh, when we are building our wall, then the mortar will go up into those voids, creating a, a stiffer structure, right? A more structurally sound uh, wall. With this frogged type, I can see there's like this little indent in the brick. And same idea, but now it's almost like a key that's happening with our mortar. So when we put this brick and we push it into place, the mortar is going to go up into this void in here. And that's what's giving us our structural rigidity, especially in this latitudinal direction, right? In that sideways direction, because this is like providing that strength, not so much the compression, but the other directions. So when we, when we talk about our uh, size of our bricks, um, there are some, some standard sizes, uh, but there is some variation. You can see figure 4.4-10 for some standard sizes of these, these bricks. However, uh, this is kind of critical, and, 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 and we talked a little bit about this before on, on how we're 
attaching our brick to like say a CMU wall for structural support, right? And the, the point is that uh, for most standard and modular bricks, we have three courses with three mortar bed joints will be this eight inches tall to match up with our CMU wall. So if you think about what that means, if I had my row of bricks here, once I have those three courses, if I were to add this total height together, uh, and that includes the height of the brick plus the height of this mortar bed in between, this total height should be eight inches. In order to have, uh, if I were to look at a bird's eye view, and I had like a CMU wall and my clay masonry units, and then I can tie them together because they're at the same elevation, right? So that's, that's what that's about, just to get the elevation right. Uh, we'll see something like down here where I have a four inch wide by two and three, two and two thirds high uh, block or brick. Uh, and then using a joint thickness of three quarters. Uh, and then once I have three courses, I end up with the eight inches. So that's, that's what this is all about here. So moving on to the physical properties of these uh, clay masonry units, a uh, couple that we care about. One is the compression strength. And now we're saying, we talked about this before with our compression, if we had like a structural wall, we're much more concerned about the live load and dead load pushing vertically down. That's what our compression strength of our clay uh, would be concerned with. We talked about compression strength of the mortar, same idea, right? Uh, this could be a function of what type of clay was used and how it was manufactured and the burning temperature. But you can see there's a, a, a massive uh, variation between a low strength clay of 1500 and a high strength clay of 20,000 PSI. So of course if I have a, a heavy load, a heavy structural wall, heavy load that I'm supporting with a structural wall, I would go for this high strength clay uh, masonry unit. A second physical property, the absorption, how much water is going to be sucked up by the brick, right? And once again, function of what kind of clay it is and how it was manufactured and, and, and burned in the kiln. Um, now, as far as what we want, we want it to be not overly, we don't want it to have too much of that suction, right? Uh, so we want a suction of less than 20 grams of water per minute. And this should make sense because if I have a mortar and mortar has this water in it and if I put this clay and it sucks all the water out I'm gonna lose my bond strength and that's what this is saying it produces a maximum bond strength and minimum water penetration if I can keep this suction less than 20 grams of water per minute the last physical property the durability that this is the the idea that the bricks can break down if water penetrates into the brick and then I'm in this freeze thaw cycle or if the water is just going in and eroding the brick once again, function of the brick itself, so the pore size, and that makes sense. A bigger pore size, I get more water in there, more freezing and compression issues, and also the burning temperature. Bricks with high compressive strength, ah, bad sentence. Bricks with high compressive strength and low absorption usually have higher durability. I think we have bricks in there one too many times. And that should make sense, right? So if I have a high compressive strength, it means it's a very, really solid, dense object. Uh, it's not going to want to allow water to get in. And if water does get in and tries to expand, it can actually withstand that because it won't, you know, it has that high compressive strength, so it won't break down. And then also low absorption means less water gets in there in the first place. So we talk about the physical properties. Uh, we also care about the natural color. Brick is, a, is, is very much used in a, as an aesthetic type of material, right? We care about what it looks like. Um, are you going to have a lot of variation and patterns in here? Do you want your brick to look uniform? Uh, as far as this color, of course, it depends on, on what the clay is made out of, but also the burning temperature and the length of burning. It's almost like you can imagine these darker colors were, were burned longer, and it almost it brings out that that carbon, that blacker color, right? Also the texture. Uh, the texture of the brick is, is put on the brick during this uh, process by a steel die. And that should make sense because if you have a more uh, rough surface on your steel die, you're going to get a higher texture within your brick. Uh, as far as size variation, uh, clay does shrink during this process and we have specifications for how much we allow this to happen. However, there will be some variation in brick sizes.
So when we classify this brick, we use the ASTM standards as we did for other materials as well. And what we're looking at is types, grades, and classes based on this idea of a weathering index. And I can see this map having these weathering uh, regions, right? So Colorado's right here, and it looks like we have two different regions in here. This would be like um, a severe weathering, and this would be a moderate weathering. Uh, so, and then down here, this is negligible down in Southern California, Southern Texas, and, and down here in Florida, right? So what that means is the weathering is, is based on this number of annual freezing cycles per year and also uh, the rainfall that happens during the winter. Based on that, we can come up with these SW, which stands for severe weathering, grade MW, moderate weathering, and grade NW, this negligible weathering, right? And based on that, we can define what our strength needs to be. Of course, if you're going to have high weathering, we already said that we need a stronger brick so it doesn't start to uh, degrade on us, right? So, uh, so I see that the strength is, doesn't need to be as high as I change my weathering system. Now, there's two parts to this. One is the average of five bricks. If I were to pull any random five bricks, the average of those five bricks has to be at least 300 PSI. But in addition to that, I can't have like one weak brick and four really strong bricks. So any individual brick can only be as low as 2,500 PSI. So we're looking at both those when we're trying to define what our, how we're trying to grade our brick, right? Not only are we concerned with the compressive strength, we're also worried or concerned with our maximum water absorption. And uh, like we said, we want less water absorbing if we're in those areas where we have a lot of freeze and thaw cycles. So in this SW, the severe conditions, we don't want very much moisture that can get sucked in here, right? So we have 17, but I can have more moisture and even unlimited when I get to that uh, negligible weathering category. The last category we would look at for our designated SW, MW, or NW would be our maximum saturation coefficient. So similar to water absorption, uh, saturation, once again, lowest, we want our lowest saturation within these uh, severe uh, weathering conditions and then down from there. Uh, the difference between saturation and water absorption, if you think about it, saturation is like the most amount of water that can be absorbed by a brick versus uh, maximum water over just this five hour boiling. So more on this uh, SW, MW, NW. Uh, how am I gonna use these different grades? Well, an SW I would use for foundations and other structures below grade, uh, especially when there's gonna be some freezing conditions. The moderate weathering, exterior walls, uh, vertical masonry, but now we're above grade. And the negligible weathering, all those interior masonry, or as a backup, um, or in the areas where we have no freezing conditions, right? So that was that wraps up our clay masonry unit. Let's move on to the concrete masonry unit. Uh, starting with the, the raw materials, with our cementaceous materials, right? Our, our Portland cement, along with the water and the aggregates and any kind of admixture. So this will look really familiar to when we talked about cement and concrete, right? Uh, we can see these different types of units and when we, when we move into the ingredients, when we have aggregates, uh, there's really two types of, of CMUs. There's either the normal weight or the lightweight CMU. So with a normal weight CMU, we have sand, gravel, limestone, air-cooled slag. If we have a lightweight CMU, what we're doing is we're adding more materials with a, with a lower density, right? Uh, these lower density materials that we're putting into the mix include this expanded shale or expanded slag, which means there's a lot of air within there. Um, coal cinders, if you've ever felt those cinders uh, in a fire after the, the fire's out, right? They're really light, a lot of air content, and also pumice. Uh, just like with, uh, with concrete, we have the other admixtures that, that can include air entrapment. We can actually add air into the mix by these uh, adding these admixtures. It sucks the air into the mix, right? Water repelling agents. We talked about how water can be really bad with clay masonry units, same thing with concrete masonry units. We can add this admixture to keep the water from wanting to suck into the block. Accelerators, uh, just like with concrete, it increases the or decreases the time for the, the concrete to set up. Workability agents, same idea, like a super plasticizer lets it get into the voids and whatever else into our formwork, our forms for the CMUs. Uh, and coloring pigments, pigments, if we want it to look like a certain, uh, if we want a certain pigment, a certain color to our, to our wall. 
So with this, uh, like I said, the, the primary bonding agent is our Portland cement. And there's two types of Portland cement we can use. We talked about Portland cement before when we talked about concrete. Uh, type 1, which is our normal Portland cement, or type 3, high early strength, sets up earlier and even gives us a slightly higher overall strength when it's totally cured, right? Uh, as far as our aggregates, we want hard uniform gradation, same as when we talked about concrete before. Usually we have a maximum size of our aggregates of 3 eighths of an inch and we want durable with no organic material in here. And this would be 90% of the weight, so our aggregates is a, are a majority of our, of our mix, right? Uh, concrete blocks, if we compare that to when we talked about cast in place concrete, we're talking less cement overall and a lower water to cement ratio. Uh, it's a much drier mix, right? And you remember, remember that whole water to cement ratio, right? So very low slump type of thing. For the manufacturing of CMUs, uh, we're starting with these raw materials and we batch them, we mold them. Uh, we use a high pressure. We talked about the curing process with concrete before, right? Well, there's really two different curing processes with these CMUs. Either we're going to have a high pressure steam curing within an autoclave or low pressure steam curing in a steam kiln. So it's either going to be in the autoclave or the kiln, and it's related to pressure uh, and, and also temperature. Uh, we have the cubing and storage like before separating them into the individual blocks and then store them and then finally deliver them out to the site. Here's a video of the process. Uh, once again, recommend watching the process and see what it looks like in real life. Uh, as far as the physical properties for CMU walls, we're concerned with compressive strength once again. And I will tell you that CMU walls are more used for structural uh, building than the uh, clay. So uh, definitely compressive strength becomes more of a, more of a factor, right? Uh, this is based on the net surface area, which makes sense because well, we've been talking about this idea of PSI for the strength of our mix, right, which stands for pounds per square inch. So if I have a greater surface area, I can handle a greater load. And that's a function of the aggregate and the gradation, uh, type and amount of cementitious material, compaction, moisture and temperature considerations. And the key is that we do get a higher strength if we have a wetter mix. Uh, we're also concerned with tensile strength, so when we're, when we're pulling on our concrete. Now, it's not so much pulling uh, on the concrete, because you don't, you don't really hang me anything from them, right? But it's more about uh, the same idea of this flexural strength. So, so in this, and this can play a part is it, if I have these blocks together, and, and I think about um, maybe there's some settlement, right? Well, if it's trying to settle, then that bottom course is in tension. So I do have a tensile strength. I also have a flexural strength where it's trying to, to twist, right? So that's really what we're talking about down here. Um, and it's, it, they are related to the, um, to the compressive strength. Compressive strength testing is really how we're going to measure the strength of our CMU walls. And then from that, we can derive these values. So we know from tension, it'll be like 7 to 10% of that total compressive strength way way lower right it's not really made to be in compression just like concrete that's why we added our steel uh, flexural strength 15 to 20 percent still very low compared to that compressive strength e value e value is i think we talked about it briefly it was like this slope of our of our stress strain diagram and if it were a it's the relationship to how much it's going to change in shape when we add this load in here right so, uh, so just for a general idea, our values would be three to 1200 times the compressive strength. So CMU, uh, physical properties, we care about the water absorption, how much water will be absorbed. And of course that's dependent on the porosity, the larger the pores, the more water and the pore structure of the concrete, same idea. And of course this will impact the permeability, you know, how much water will, will be able to go through our concrete block. Also the thermal conductivity, we want, we want there to be a, a all air, no water, uh, because air is a better thermal conductive material than water, uh, and sound absorption. Uh, high water absorption and initial suction can de decrease bond strength. So the same thing we were talking about before with the clay masonry units. If I have my mortar on here, it can suck the water out and that'll decrease the amount of water in my mix and decrease the overall bond strength. Here we can see the maximum moisture content percentage of the total absorption. Uh, once again, we're taking an average over five units, right? 
And this is also dependent on location uh, for your average annual relative humidity, right? And if you have highly humid versus a lesser humid, and we talk about how much linear shrinkage we may have to worry about. So this, this all corresponds to this volume change. We have small dimensional changes based on temperature, moisture, uh, content, and carbonation. What is carbonation? Within the concrete is, is it absorbs carbon dioxide from the air. So you might remember wood, and we said when, when we have a uh, high humidity, uh, what happens is the wood will suck the air, suck the water out of the air, and it can actually expand and change in shape. Well, it's somewhat similar with these CMUs, but now there's, it's sucking the carbon dioxide from the air, and that can actually cause a change in shape. These are very small dimensional changes, but still something to be aware of. Uh, CMUs are pre-shrunk and dried to help keep this from happening, right? Same idea with this, when we took wood and we seasoned it, we put it in the area we were gonna eventually install it, same idea with these CMUs. So same idea when we're, when we're picking a block, we have, we could either do a hollow load bearing unit, a solid load bearing unit, a uh, concrete building brick, or a hollow non load bearing block, right? A lot of different types of blocks, but what, what I think the bigger concerns are, are the, uh, the compressive strength of the block. So just like before, we, we have an average over three, but each individual one has to have a minimum amount. And other than the compressive strength, we're also concerned with how much water can be observed, can be absorbed, right? Whether you're using, uh, and it depends if you're using the lightweight concrete, medium weight concrete, or normal weight concrete, and how and what type of block. So you can use this table and, and mat, mix and match and get an idea or hopefully select which type of unit based on what strength you need and also uh, what if it's a lightweight, medium weight, or heavyweight. And last, how much water absorption uh, you can have. So let's move over a little bit to uh, unit masonry design. So this, the design aspect is always like, what about for like a structural unit? How are we going to design this whole thing, right? And when we talk about, about masonry, uh, we're, we're, we're dealing with the same structural loads we talked about before with dead loads and live loads, seismic and, earth and wind loads. Uh, does it need to be fire resistant? How watertight does it need to be, right? All those things should be the structural needs. We also, with brick especially, have these aesthetic needs. What's the color? What's the pattern going to look like? Um, any other construction considerations? Uh, and building codes will require this minimum wall thickness and maximum lateral support spacing. So what this means is if we're building a brick wall, and it isn't very thick, of course, we'll need more lateral, meaning this side-to-side -side, uh, support, right? Uh, if it's a thicker wall, then we need less of those lateral supports. But So the building code will tell us how thick our wall needs to be, and based on that thickness, what our supports need to be. As far as our types of walls, we can have a solid wall, a cavity wall, a veneered wall, or a reinforced wall. So let's take a look at those types of walls. Starting with our solid masonry wall, it means that everything is filled in uh, on our wall. It's one solid structure, so everything, there's no empty voids, everything's filled with, with grout or mortar. This is different than a cavity masonry wall, as you probably expect. Cavity means we have a space, right? Uh, so now we have two widths, and what a width is, is a width is, is one, one uh, row, one section, one wall of your masonry, right? So this is one, and then we have a CMU as my second one, or here I have two clay widths. Uh, here I have two CMU widths. Uh, so whatever it is, if I have two of them and they're at least four inches thick, the total wall is at least four inches thick, and there's a separation of uh, somewhere between two and four and a half inches, we consider that to be a, a cavity masonry wall. So this is something you would do like for insulation or uh, thermal protection or moisture protection, you know, giving that little barrier between these two walls, this little cavity in here. And similar to that is a veneered masonry wall. The difference between a veneered masonry wall and a cavity, in fact, you'll see that the same, same picture was used here as the last slide. Uh, with the veneer, then this brick is not considered structural at all. It is, it is, the only thing it's there for is for aesthetics, right? It's just so that we see that in this case, this CMU wall is providing 100% of the structural support in this brick. The only thing it's doing is self-supporting, supporting itself, right? 
So uh, that's what this is basically saying. Wood or metal carrying the load. Uh, masonry may be tied, but is not structurally engaged. Masonry serves as the exterior finish. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we still can. You have an insulation between the two. It's not necessarily considered a cavity because this part isn't structural, though. And this last little bit, severe weathering grade facing brick. Because it's an exterior uh, application, um, you know, it should be able to withstand the elements. Uh, also, type N mortar. And if you remember your different mortars, type N was that exterior mortar as well. So we have that weatherproofing. As far as reinforcing for our masonry walls, uh, we can add steel, and this adds, adds, add the steel will increase our tensile strength, our shear strength, and our compression, compressive strength, right? Uh, and you can imagine what this would look like uh, in different units. Here I see these two widths of, of clay masonry units, and in between the two, I have this vertical reinforcement. Um, and this is what we're talking about. Reinforced hollow masonry, reinforcing placed in hollow core. So here I see this hollow core within the CMU, and I have some reinforcement going vertically right here. Uh, reinforced solid masonry, it can be in between those, those widths, like I've already talked about. And I can see some horizontal reinforcement here as well, right? So reinforcement throughout, just adding that steel within this grout and mortar to give it that extra rigidity, that extra strength in every direction. Here's some more examples. Vertical are typically bars. Horizontal could either be bars or wires. Here I see a, a wire. Here I see bars. Um, actually, technically, this is not considered a reinforced CMU, but this is considered a beam bond. Slightly different. What a beam bond is, is, is this U-shaped CMU unit that is filled, uh, it's filled with this grout and gives it a, a, a greater structural strength. So you'll see these beam bonds as like starter courses, or you'll see a beam bond uh, up top. Here you see it finishing off of the top layer with a beam bond, giving it that extra, extra structural strength, more than just a reinforced CMU. As far as the, uh, the pattern bond, um, we have a number of different bonds. We have running bond is probably your most familiar with for bricks, where uh, basically we have each layer is is centered, um, you know, half a brick over from the layer above. One third running bond is almost the same, but now we are one third of the way over. We're not centered right on there, so we have this staggered pattern. Uh, sixth course headers uh, means that I, if I look up here, every six rows up, what I do is I have these bricks are turned uh, 90 degrees, right? And the idea behind that is if I have two widths of brick, those bind the two together, uh, giving me some more structural support. And I see a, a number of these six course Flemish headers where now I have, uh, it's like an alternating pattern where, I, pattern where I have a header turned sideways and then the running and then bond, running bond, then turn sideways, so on and so forth, right? And you can see all the different ways. Stack bond, we have all of our bricks exactly right on top of one another and uh, so on and so forth. So sometimes this can be for aesthetic appeal, uh, and sometimes it can be more for a structural need. But either way, those are some common terminology of those bonds. For the uh, here's uh, here they are for the CMU walls. So we have running bond, uh, running bond with a four inch tall basket weave, horizontal stack bond, vertical stack bond, turning all my my CMUs on end, so on and so forth. So you get an idea of all these different ways that I can uh, put patterns into these walls. Just like with concrete, uh, masonry is subject to cracking. Uh, and because this cracking can happen for several reasons, uh, but the cracking can either be through the joints in between our bricks or in the masonry units themselves. Uh, some reasons this might happen are expansion and contraction from temperature changes. So as the temperature changes, this brick is trying to expand and contract. We talked about uh, last time about um, the mortar being too stiff and not allowing that to happen. Well, that'll cause cracking, right? We can have expansion and contraction from moisture changes. So if it becomes more humid out, our brick can absorb some moist, some of that moisture and that'll, uh, that will expand. CMUs from carbonation, same thing where we said earlier, where the CMU wall, if there's a lot of carbon, C carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide will actually cause the, the CMU to expand. Structural movements from settlement. So if I have part of my wall starting to settle, of course, that's going to cause cracking, right? 
Any other stress concentration? If I have like, a, say I put a second story in a house that wasn't designed for it and double the load on that wall, well, I'd have much more stress, right? Or too rigid of a structure. If it isn't flexible enough, then I can have that cracking as well. And this can be worsened if I had dissimilar materials because they will expand and contract at different rates, like a door frame with brick, right? Or large temperature differentials. So if I have an exterior wall and it's negative 30 degrees and interior, it's like 100 degrees. If I have that big temperature difference, it causes extra stresses that can lead to, to cracking. Also, this is, goes back to too rigid of a structure. How does that happen? Well, if I have a roof or a floor that keeps it from moving, it makes it too rigid, that'll, that'll cause the cracking as well. So what do we do? We can add these, uh, just like we did in concrete, add these expansion joints. Um, and I can see that, uh, that if I had a 100 foot long wall and, uh, and I had a temperature change, a fairly large temperature change, it can, it can change length, expand by almost half an inch, right? And we have to allow for that. So we put in these expansion joints and you can see we can have um, rubber or plastic or neoprene or something in there that will allow the brick to expand and contract or the masonry to expand and contract. And you can see we have some guides here. So if we have a length of the wall whether, and then we, we look at whether it's heated uh, and insulated or heated and not insulated and what the temperatures, the outside temperature range can be. So uh, coldest temperature to the warmest temperature from the winter to the summer, right? Greater temperatures changes need, I need a greater expansion joint. So other than the expansion joints, how can we control these cracks or how can we keep these cracks from happening? Uh, three common ways, use moisture controlled CMU. So, so use CMUs that don't suck in as much water, right? We talked about that earlier. Install horizontal steel reinforcing, so that'll give it that strength to keep it from wanting to separate. And then, of course, these control joints, which we already talked about. Um, and there may be times when you're using a combination. So you might have some expansion joints, but maybe they're far apart, and you also have some other horizontal reinforcement, right? And there are some guides on panels and vertical spacing of joint reinforcement. Same idea. And here we can see we're putting in a vertical joint control. Uh, this says shear key and bond beam. We talked about a bond beam just being that U-shaped CMU unit filled with grout. Uh, and the shear key is used to keep this, this lateral stability so it doesn't go this way, but at the same time, I can have it expand the other direction, right? And here we see a wall with a big expansion joint built into it. So the, the, the CMU wall has room to expand and contract. And our last topic, arches. So we can actually use CMUs to make these arches. They're really aesthetically cool looking. However, this is a very labor intensive, um, not used as much anymore, but you can do it by using like a tapered brick. So you can imagine these bricks resting on each other if they're tapered, right? Uh, or a tapered joint, either way. Uh, I highly recommend you watch this video uh, and because it actually shows a, a, a mason who's, who's doing this without any kind of form work or anything and just buttering his bricks and putting them into place and it looks like they're defying gravity. So he has a really stiff mix so it'll hold and he sets it in there, just waits just a second and then lets go and it doesn't move out of place and then he hurries fast enough where, so basically you have hold it long enough but then move quick enough so that nothing's going to fall and he can build a whole arch. Really cool video. Uh, but I don't want to take your time on this recorded video to have a video and a video this time, so we're going to let you watch it on your own. Here's some examples of some arched brick openings. Really cool looking. We can also have lintels, another opening. So a lintel uh, is over like a doorway or a window or something like that. And they can either be made out of masonry themselves or usually there's some kind of structural member like a, like a L bracket or something like that that's supporting the masonry above. Because after we do the lintel, then we're just continuing on with the masonry above, right? Uh, if steel is used, then of course it needs to be protected against moisture, so galvanized. That's what I have as usual. Hope it was informative. Let me know if you have any questions or comments, and I'll see you all next time. Thanks.